Warning, the following podcast contains references to irreligious and blasphemous concepts like logic and Jesus taking it in the ass. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Ken Ham's new faith healing medical textbook, Cancers in Genesis. Are you fascinated by mysterious ways like malignant baby tumors? Does your pediatric oncologist seem a little too interventionist? Or maybe you're just glad to hear this isn't a Richard Dawkins book. Doesn't matter why, just buy it so we could build a fake boat. Cancer's in Genesis. God let there be light, so you had to expect a little melanoma. And a whole bunch of other cancer. And now, the scathing atheist. Hi, this is the Prophet Jeremiah from the No Religion Required podcast, and I wanted to let you know that we didn't get genetic variation in humans because a couple of apes fucked in front of a couple of sticks to create spotted, speckled, and striped humans, as detailed by goats in chapter 30 of Genesis, but nevertheless, we did indeed evolve from filthy fucking monkey men. It's Thursday! It's April 30th! And my liver definitely still hurts from partying with the amazing crew at ReasonCon 2015. Good times. Awesome times. Good times. I'm no illusions. I'm Heath Enright. And from Flag Carpet, Valdosta, Georgia, this is the Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, a pro-Israel group will hate Jews vicariously through the Muslims. A dildo store probably won't open in Mecca, but we're going to talk about it anyway. And Lucinda will join us in wondering why this book didn't end when Jesus died. But first, the diatribe. As near as I can tell, there was only one person at ReasonCon that didn't have any fun. Now, I'm sorry, let me back that up a bit. Because there were two old Christian ladies working the hotel bar that didn't seem to be enjoying themselves very much. And I think a a few of the caterers at the VIP dinner that got to hear Heath call God a cross-dressing transgender hermaphrodite that eventually landed on gay man, they didn't seem to be enjoying themselves much either. Uh, And also the dude that was trying to sleep in the room next to the one that we were partying in until 5 a.m., he definitely didn't have fun unless he really enjoys calling the cops on us over and over again, in which case he had a blast. But as near as I can tell, there was only one person who intentionally came to this conference that didn't enjoy himself. The weather was shit on Saturday. It's a, a little colder than it normally would be this time of year, and there's a pissy mist of rain that never let up for a minute, but that didn't stop him from coming. Might have stopped all the people he thought were coming with him, but he was there all by his lonesome, parked as close to the event as the hotel security would let him park, and he had a little Christian flag. See, he was there to tell us that we were going to hell, and other than, I guess, a couple of people brave in the rain long enough to fuck with him, I don't know that he got to condemn anybody. By one o'clock, he'd retreated to the safety of his van, hiding from a dozen podcasters that would happily best him in a debate on the record, and all that remained of his feeble protest against reason was a rain-soaked blue and white flag flaccidly drooping against the passenger's door of his van. By four o'clock, he'd given up entirely. See, I guess it turned out we weren't as fun to yell at as he thought we would be. Turns out it isn't as fun to condemn a minority when you're outnumbered. See, I I have a retraction that I need to toss out, and I've never been so happy to retract something I said on this show, because in last week's diatribe, I said there was nowhere on earth where you could walk a mile and see a dozen don't bother praying signs, but clearly, I had forgotten about the parking lot for atheist conventions. Oh, the glorious bumper stickers. I I had a lot of fun all weekend picturing some wholesome Christian family. Didn't know what the fuck they were getting into. You know, they're on their way down to the Holy Land experience or whatever. Decide to stop in Hickory along the way. They're toting their luggage into the hotel. They see the first bumper sticker. They're like, what the fuck? They see the second one. They're like, oh, holy shit. Now they're like ushering their children's eyes away from slogans like religion is make-believe, beware of God, and nothing fails like prayer. And then they finally get inside just to be greeted by a bunch of scarlet letters and Jesus jokes on one in three t-shirts. They grab their room key. They're quick heading to the fucking room, but they got to get past the bar. And sure enough, a couple of Tom and Cecil's fans showed up in the glory hole shirt. It was so awesome. The conversational snippets that waft in as they hurry past include a number of interesting new uses for Jesus' crew 
crucifixion wounds. There's a sign in the hallway that says Roast of God, 9 p.m. Some proximate conversation in the elevator dismantles Pascal's wager in three ways per floor. They finally make it to the room. They lock the door. They turn the TV to TBN, crank it all the way up, pull out the Gideon, and then leave under the cover of darkness the following morning. Bwah! And finally, finally, at some point while they're praying for the souls of their children in the aftermath of that atheist onslaught, for a brief fucking second, they know what it's like for me to walk a mile in any direction. They know what it's like to be bombarded with messages about a worldview that they find objectionable every time they turn around. They know for the briefest moment what it's like to be anything other than a Christian in this country. And maybe, just maybe, during a conversation mom and dad didn't really want to have, their kids learned for the first time that there are people out there that don't believe in God. And maybe something the kids read or overheard sticks. And maybe one of the caterers that begrudgingly poured drinks for godless heathens overheard something in one of the talks before our roast that they're going to have to bring back to their pastor, right? You know, maybe one of the bartenders or hotel clerks had their doubts for a long time and just never realized there was an atheist community that they could connect to. Now, these are just a couple of the ancillary benefits of having these conferences, of course. It's by no means the point, but all of this stuff matters. So even if we're doing something as hedonistic as just all showing up at the same hotel to get shit-faced together, that matters. It matters that we come together, and obviously, you know, the talks and the charities that are represented there and the community groups that are strengthened, all of that shit matters probably a little bit more. But what really matters the most is the friendships that we're creating. Because we're creating support networks for people who can't find those things locally. We're giving people a chance to escape the suffocating grasp of passive evangelism and not-so-passive evangelism for a weekend and put down a mask that they're forced to wear every other day of their lives. You know, some people dismiss the utility of atheist conventions because they say that, you know, all we're doing is preaching to the choir. Well, maybe that's true and maybe that isn't, but just assembling the choir has plenty of benefits. How the hell else are we going to sing? You know, the connections and the collaborations board at these events, these have real consequences. They tackle real problems, and there is work to do that we need to do together. And most of the time, it seems impossible. But when you're in a room with hundreds of other people that will stand up and cheer for somebody's personal triumph over faith, these insurmountable obstacles between this nation and secularism seem a hell of a lot more surmountable. Of course... You have to wake up, you know. The, the weekend's over. We drag our asses out of bed an hour after checkout, and we have to go back to the real world. We have to drive down I-75 and read billboards with messages like, Jesus is the way, God is the only truth, and I shit you not, evolution is a lie, exclamation mark, Genesis 1. My personal favorite, by the way, it was a wacky mess of a sign. It said, Jesus is still in charge, and then it's got Jesus superimposed over a bunch of, like, army pictures, and there's soldiers and tanks and helicopters. I don't know what the fuck that was all about, but I'm sure that's a message that needs to be countered. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is professional blasphemer Heath Enright. Heath, are you ready to blaspheme? Um... <laughs> Gandalf could easily beat up Yoda in a fight. <laughs> well, I meant about God, but the inbox was a little light this week, so sure. Sure, we'll hear about that one. In our lead story tonight, Fox News Channel's resident Jesus pimp, Father Jonathan Morris, recently appeared on a segment to discuss the Iowa Faith and Freedom Coalition Summit, which was held last weekend. The event is one of several campaign stops in the artificially meaningful state of Iowa, and was attended by most, if not all, of the GOP's not-yet-failed presidential candidates. And it was Father Morris's job to analyze what it means to be Christy enough to hold public office. Right, yes. Uh, space carpenter allegiance, that's important. <laughs> they took their eye off the ball last time around. We elect this Muslim come atheist come Satan incarnate and bam, gay people start existing. <laughs> so you got to look out. It's like the, the modern incarnation of the Republican Party has a litmus test that demands that you embrace fiction and deny reality. Right? I mean, like, evolution, unelectable. Okay. Climate change, unelectable. <laughs> Omnipotent sorcerer who's going to solve all our ills as soon as he's done killing all the brown people, you're in. Unbelievable. So, check. Here's what Morris had to say about what makes a candidate qualified to make good decisions about reality. I can't wait. Ready? Quote, it's a belief in God. Oh, I didn't. Read, uh... read Bible God, sure. but not the Jewish Bible. Well, right. Yeah. <laughs> It's belief that there are <laughs> eternal consequences for your actions. And I think that a leader that doesn't have that, well, it's somebody that it's hard to trust, end quote. 
Then they asked him about atheists in particular, and he responded, quote, it certainly makes a difference who that person is, well, end quote. Uh, well, he was a really nice black person, maybe. Right, maybe. yes. Bottom line, if you think there's about to be a world apocalypse and you like that idea, <laughs> you're not allowed anywhere fucking near the red buttons. Yeah. Or anything. Exactly. Any and isn't it funny how the people who are sticking their heads in the ground over global warming are giving us shit for not believing in eternal <laughs> consequences? Right. Come on. Fuck off. No. Against all odds, I did actually agree with one point that Morris made. He pointed out that Christians should ignore everything these candidates say about religion since they started the race. Instead, right. they should be judged on how Christian they were before they started bearing false witness about their piety. Which means Morris and I are probably both on the same page about Mike Huckabee hopefully becoming the winner of the GOP primary. <laughs> that would be hilarious. And in School of Jihad Knox news tonight, New York City subway advertising might be about to get a little more contentious. U.S. District Judge John Kotal ruled last Tuesday in favor of an ad campaign that reads, Killing Jews is worship that draws us closer to Allah. That's real. It and it's that. actually sponsored by an anti Muslim hate <laughs> group. tricky. <laughs> the American Freedom Defense Initiative is their name. Wow, not clear. Now, the ad was originally rejected by the MTA on the grounds that it could be interpreted as a call to violence. Oh, somehow. Oh, could it? But since the court ruled that the ad was obviously more about fearing Muslims than hating Jews, <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> okay, but in what sense is that not potentially a call to violence? Right. Even, even if we forget about the gross bigotry towards Muslims for a second. If it said, like... Beating up gay people brings us closer to Jesus. I can, I can easily see a forgetful KKK member being reminded about the whole point of the New York City trip in the first place. Right. And <laughs> right. That's true. Just one little example. Now, Call to violence. No. Look, I mean, I'm a big fan of this First Amendment shit, obviously. It's just that I like my freedom of speech applied evenly. You know, <laughs> nice. maybe I'm wrong, but I'm guessing if a Muslim group st started putting up signs with the most genocidal passages of the Old Testament over a tagline like, Jew say what? <laughs> The court would react a little differently. Probably it would different. also <laughs> probably act a little bit different if a Muslim group tried to place an identical ad with the same words and images. It'd be equally not clear to anybody what was happening. Right. And I've got a funny feeling an atheist group would not be able to get away with, like, religions murder religions to be more religious. <laughs> American atheists don't see that happening. It would be City. worth a try, though. Of course, this was only one of a series of ads placed by the AFDI, and the other six went up without issue. Now, these included messages reminding people that even moderate Muslims still might blow them up, a plea for America to stop sending humanitarian aid to all Islamic countries, and an ad that contained these actual words in conjunction. Quote, in any war between the civilized man and the savage, support the civilized man. Support Israel, defeat jihad. End quote. Can you believe that shit? The civilized man and the savage? Fuck. Civilized person, please. Let's not be sexist <laughs> Nomenclature. And from the striped ass file tonight. Christian YouTube evangelist Josh Fowerstein was having trouble fitting his entire face into the frame of his online videos, especially considering he's been using what seems to be Abraham Zapruder's iPod Shuffle. <laughs> so, in response to this issue, Fowerstein decided against you know, eating a vegetable once and instead started a donation page on GoFundMe.com last August, yes, he did. asking for $20,000, $20,000 to purchase better video equipment. The campaign was actually successful. It was more than successful. And now he has enough money to buy about 20,000 cameras capable of capturing YouTube quality video. Right. But there's no indication he's actually made any such purchase. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to give this guy the benefit of the doubt, you have to assume that he's so stupid that he'd spend 20 grand before considering maybe he should just turn his phone on its side. <laughs> and and he phone. certainly seems that stupid. <laughs> but since he also never bought the fucking camera, you have to further assume that he got tricked into like trading the money for three magic beans <laughs> or something. So the intrepid Hemet Meta was among those who have since asked Forstein to prove the fundraiser wasn't a giant scam. In response to the friendly atheist email he got, the preacher refused to provide any documentation whatsoever and also threatened a lawsuit. Skeptical podcaster Matt Kovacs asked similar questions in person, and Forstein claimed that he ended up buying two cheaper cameras. They cost about $2,500 a piece. But he also purchased, quote, an entire studio. Oh. And during this exchange, it should be noted 
that Forrestine was sweating and stumbling on words like a Goldman Sachs exec at an SEC. <laughs> yeah, but in his defense, I mean, it, it, look at the dude. I, this guy breaks out in a sweat when he's brushing his teeth. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. It might be hot. Sometimes it's hot in the morning. <laughs> Well, despite allegedly owning two new cameras and also an entire studio, <laughs> Forrestine's videos continue to be about 50 pixels tall and two pixels wide. Right. So it looks <laughs> like he decided to stick with the Zapruder model and spend the 20 grand on Cartier watches and daily dry cleaning for his disgusting red hat. It's a signature thing, though. I mean, it's like Indiana Jones. He can't <laughs> be seen without it. And in, well, they do live in balls news tonight. Prosperity gospel preacher, repugnant fraud, and man still flying around in a busted up hoopty jet. Creflo Dollar <laughs> is sick and tired of the whole internet making fun of him for trying to crowdsource a $65 million dollar private jet so he tempted us with something new to make fun of him about specifically <laughs> Might be better the inevitable butt fuckery of pokemon players what? yes according to creflo pokemon makes you gay that's that was it the whole I, time i don't think i don't think he gets how that game works it's <laughs> that's probably what it is somebody said no 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 bend over this is how it's played <laughs> it's like we're touching decks i mean I'm touching my deck, and the other right. dude's touching his deck. But I mean, if the Dutch router's gay, I don't want to be straight. And is who what I'm saying. does? According to what Creflo is calling a study, teens of the 80s and 90s, quote, this is an actual quote, had their sexuality warped by Ash and his fruity <laughs> friends, end real quote. I guess that's... From the abstract. He also offered further evidence that Creflo Dollar sees dicks everywhere by pointing out how many of the Pokemon characters were phallic, which clearly led children to desire phallic shapes, but only the boys, because otherwise it wouldn't be gay and that would be okay. I guess. It's even creeping into the Republican Party. I never expected Herman Cain would be making direct quotes from the climax of a gay movie. <laughs> That I believe I it's from the coming. Pokemon movie. <laughs> of course, this isn't the first time Pikachu and friends have fallen afoul of reality-challenged religious leaders. The game was banned in Saudi Arabia after 2001 for being a tool of the Jews to destroy <laughs> Islam by turning their kids into degenerate gamblers, of course. But not to be outdone, Christian extremists have widely criticized the game because of the concept of Pokemon evolution. <laughs> Which, of course, has nothing whatsoever to do with real evolution, but it pisses them off anyway because they're stupid. <laughs> Speaking of which, in OK Stupid news tonight, Oklahoma GOP State Representative Kevin Calvey got oh, extremely guy, agitated during a debate <laughs> over Senate Bill 548, which would give judges in the state a small raise in salary. Uh -huh. Apparently, he was already pissed about court decisions that went in favor of the pro-choice side on the abortion issue. So what did and, he do? <laughs> and when he heard about the salary bump, he went ballistic and yelled out something to the effect of, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd walk over to the Supreme Court building right now, douse myself in gasoline, and light myself on fire. Now, <laughs> Senate floor. Now, given the legal history in Oklahoma, I'm inclined to agree they probably don't deserve more money, but... My reasoning isn't quite the same as Calvi's. Also, pretty sure my reaction would be different, whether or not I was a Christian. Honestly. Right. Hyperbole much? Now, judging by his legislative record and reputation in the state house, I'm willing to bet every one of his colleagues bought him a copy of The God Delusion and some lighter fluid that afternoon. So keep in mind, this is a guy who tried to pass a law making it illegal to arrest state officials. He, like, he actually tried to legislate RoboCop's secret directive. <laughs> Into real law. He really did. So, a couple of things I'm confused about. First of all, it bothered him that the court wasn't going his way on the abortion issue, but it was the very small pay raise that pushed him over the edge. Right. I mean, that was the that, straw. Now, now I'm doused myself. Lighting myself. <laughs> right. I guess dead babies is one thing, but dead babies plus inflation and cost of living, that's outrageous <laughs> lighting myself on fire. But more importantly... What the fuck was with the if I wasn't a Christian part? Yeah, was, right. Was he waiting for a, a, a pro-life atheist from the Oklahoma legislature to self-immolate right there? I mean, and how would that person even know they were supposed to do that? He even have no sense of right and wrong. We wouldn't know whether <laughs> Oh, right, right. Especially if we're hungry from all the fetus talk. Obviously, they were talking about fetus. <laughs> so in the end, the fire suicide plan never really panned out, and the – Proactive baby killers got a raise. So maybe maybe his plan was just to light a Muslim on fire when he got there. 
That could have been it. And from the anal P-Robes file tonight, Mike Huckabee's backup skeleton and future organ mine, Pat Robertson, <laughs> continued doling out advice on the 700 Club last week, specifically about what to do in the event of a spouse cheating on you. And as if this should make some sort of difference in his answer, it was made clear that this wasn't just normal marital infidelity. This was gay cheating. Oh, so um, cheating. if I had to guess, and I've already read the story, so I don't, but if I did have to <laughs> guess, he blames the wife for not taking it in the ass. I, I, I already know that, isn't it, exactly? But that's what I was expecting it's, once I saw the question. I guess it's sort of like that. So Pierre listens to the story from a woman who's, Husband of 11 years got drunk and cheated on her with a man from their church. And it ends with the question of whether she should forgive her husband. Which point, Robertson goes into some sort of uh, mathematical calculation, I guess. He's like, uh, okay, so you're married for 11? 11 years? 11 years. This guy's drunk on whiskey? Okay, drunk on whiskey. Whiskey, got to factor out the gay coefficient. Carry the six. Yeah, he's still like 90% hetero, so it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Definitely forgive him. It's fine. But you get AIDS now. That's a small price to now pay. You have AIDS. Yeah, apparently it's okay as long as he isn't a, quote, habitual homosexual. <laughs> right. End quote. Those are P. Robe's words. So I guess if he only sucks a dick at parties, he can, he can stop at any time he wants. It's okay. <laughs> And in P. Robes a little deeper news tonight, the very next day, after the habitual homosexual thing, Robertson invited televangelist <laughs> Kenneth Copeland of If God Didn't Want Our Kids to Have Measles, He Wouldn't Have Given Us Measles fame that guy. to see if perhaps he could say something awesome. even more asinine. And I'd say Copeland's senile <laughs> rant about how he's like the good Osama bin Laden, that counts as a success, damn it. Yeah. I think you might have done it. So far be it for me to slow down the momentum on that lecture Christian good guy Bin Laden, please continue. Okay, that's where we're going. Just try to keep that in mind while we, well, we start nowhere fucking near <laughs> that. So while discussing God's magical healing powers, Copeland explained to geriatric homophobic Alfred Ian e. Newman that he'd <laughs> seen God unkill people with his own eyes. Quote, someone died in the foyer of our church and God raised him from the dead. He had a heart attack and just died, and the Lord raised him up, end quote. So if I'm following this correctly, a dude fell down once on the way to his church and wasn't dead. Because, I mean, because how the fuck did he rule out just falling down? I mean, was there a cardiologist on scene? Did they declare him dead? Did the guy just sit there for a couple of mid, like days or whatever, decomposing on the side of the fucking road and then came back from the grave? How the fuck does Kenneth Copeland determine the difference between a guy fainting and a guy dying of a heart attack and being resurrected seconds later? Wouldn't yeah. they look the same? I, I get resurrected mid-blink almost every day. Right. That experience <laughs> never led me to describe myself as a bizarro jihadist overlord. Yes, so, right. That's where everybody we're going. remember where this is going. <laughs> so if you're wondering how making up a story of about a miraculous return from the dead relates to being Osama bin Laden's good twin. It doesn't. <laughs> Not at all. But that didn't stop Copeland from joining the two concepts in consecutive sentences. After explaining that the healing powers of Christian God is, quote, what has Islam so stirred up, end quote, he said that he and Robertson were like bin Laden, and not just because they're all decomposing. In addition to that, they're also willing to put all of their effort, their faith, their finances, and their whatever, his words, into their religion. He went on to almost get something right when he pointed out that there really isn't any difference between a Christian extremist and a Muslim extremist, Except, of course, that the latter picked the false Satan god. <laughs> I believe it was the great philosopher Walter Sobchak who once said, Say what you will about the tenets of National Socialism, at least it's an ethos. So, <laughs> And while the people who don't get Nazi. that reference recoil in horror, we'll hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate race. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Misogyny. With most forms of bigotry, I think it's really important that we weigh the action against the intention. After all, a person who hangs a swastika outside of a black college is doing something substantially different than a guy who greets all the black people he meets by telling them he really likes some rap songs. But when it comes to sexism, even the most egregious examples are often hidden behind what the perpetrators believe to be benign motives. Take, for example, a story out of Houston where a five-year-old girl was forced to change after school officials deemed the spaghetti straps on her dress too revealing for kindergarten. 
While I'm sure the school justifies the policy by some fucked up notion of adolescent modesty, the idea that dress code slut shaming starts at five is depressingly ludicrous. I mean, how the hell do you have a dress code for five-year-olds? They should be able to come to school in princess dresses and fucking chicken costumes if they want to. I guess maybe we can draw the line when kindergartners start showing up to school in leather thongs and gimp masks. But who the hell cares that a little girl's wearing spaghetti straps? Was there cleavage distracting all of the prepubescent boys from focusing on their macaroni pictures? Give me a fucking break. But maybe I'm being too short-sighted here. After all, there's nothing in the school's policy that expressly states that the dress code is about chastity. Maybe they're just trying to avert natural disasters. Because spaghetti straps have been known to cause earthquakes. Just ask Iranian Ayatollah Kazim Sadiqi. Of course, immodest outfits don't directly cause earthquakes. That assertion would be silly. But slutty clothes are the impetus for extramarital affairs, which have long been known to power subduction. And no, by the way, I'm not skipping any steps here. Here's the actual quote. Many women who dress inappropriately cause youths to go astray, taint their chastity, and incite extramarital sex in society, which increases earthquakes. End quote. So either Ayatollah Kazem Sadigi is painfully full of shit, or Iranians are having way raunchier sex than I am. But if you want to make extramarital seismology seem only moderately ignorant, we can accommodate with the quick trip to Australia, where the Victorian Registration and Qualifications Authority is investigating claims that an Islamic school in Melbourne banned female students from cross-country running for fear that it would cause them to lose their virginity. Of course, I'm trying to know how this works. I mean... Is the track covered in dicks? Do the hurdles have dildos sticking out of them? Are we doing a 100-member dash? Unfortunately, all the articles I can find on it simply state that Principal Omar Halak believes that running can somehow cause spontaneous, penisless intercourse. Of course, this is the same principal that was reprimanded earlier this month when he told students that ISIS was a U.S.-led Western conspiracy and that Israel didn't exist. So at least he's an equal opportunity idiot. So, just a quick reminder, the road to misogyny is often paved with the best intentions. Unless it's an Islamic running track, in which case it's paved with dicks. And with that, I'll hand things back over to Noah and Heath. Thank you, Lucinda. And from the If This Is My Thermometer, Then Where Is My Pen Award file tonight, (laughs) several authors have withdrawn from an upcoming gala hosted by the Pen American Center, citing objections to the group's decision to honor the surviving staff of Charlie Hebdo with their annual Freedom of Expression Courage Award. This is awful. It really is. So in an email to Penn's leadership, novelist Rachel Kushner summed up the collective objection of the six assholes by decrying the publication's, quote, cultural intolerance and promotion of a, quote, forced secular view. And in a tweet summarizing the collective objection to their objection of everybody who isn't a pretentious dick, Salman Rushdie described them as, quote, just six pussies, six authors in search of a bit of character, end quote. Okay, so just back it up for a second. Forced secular view, as in forced not to murder people with a secular view? Apparently, yes. And do you really need to be a fan of Charlie Hebdo cartoons to... Honor the victims of a terrorist massacre? What the fuck is wrong with you people? No shit. Now, another of the half dozen abstainers said in an interview with the New York Times, quote, a hideous crime was committed, but was it a freedom of speech issue for Penn America to be self-righteous about? End quote. And apparently he thought that uh, question was rhetorical in the opposite direction because yeah. of fucking course it is. Well, what else would that be about? Their argument here, by the way, is that the, the award is traditionally given to people whose speech is under threat by a government authority. But I mean... In the past, those were the only people threatening anybody's free speech. The idea that a non-governmental entity would murder you over cartoons, that's relatively new. Yeah, and I'm sure they'd love to give the award to thousands of Muslim apostate activists that were, you know, properly executed by a recognized fascist theocracy in the UN, but those people probably weren't able to make it to the ceremony. Sorry. I wonder why. Of course, now the real root of the objection shows up a bit later in the interview when the same author starts bitching about the fact that uh, France has done a shitty job of assimilating and empowering their Muslim minority, as though there's some level of governmental bigotry that justifies murdering people for what they say (laughs) and or draw. Now, I'm going to let Andrew Solomon, the president of PEN America, answer that charge since he's the president of a conglomeration of great writers and probably better at putting words together than I am. Quote, there is courage in refusing the very idea of forbidden statements, an urgent brilliance in saying what you have been told not to say in order to make it sayable. End quote. 
So now I'm going to need a bigger headstone. That's that's going to be it's that's stuff. like my motto it's now. And from the roast master in chief file tonight, Barack Obama continues to be a second term president who can stop pretending he's not an atheist and say pretty much whatever the fuck he wants. Why can't he? It's awesome. <laughs> the state of affairs was especially entertaining last Saturday night at the White House Correspondents Dinner. Everybody should check out the video if you get a chance. Fucking hilarious. One of the things the president talked about was his legacy, specifically the part Michelle Bachman exposed about his apocalypse plan. Here's what he had to say. Quote, Michelle Bachman actually predicted I would bring about the biblical end of days. Now that's a legacy. <laughs> that's big. I mean, Lincoln, Washington, they didn't do that. End quote. So I, I guess he's just holding off until the last minute, you know, oh, January so 2017. Oh, so awesome watching him Apocalypse. laugh at Christianity. Now say what you will about the dude's quasi-legal remote control death bots and his forced sterilization of Christians and anti-religious <laughs> death camps. But that dude can tell a fucking joke. Yeah, he's got timing. Yeah, he really does. He's smooth. So in response to Obama's speech... Religious talking heads all over the media turned bright red, started cartoon steaming, and exploded. Yes, they did. Others, however, had a pretty good grasp of the situation, actually, surprisingly. For example, End Times author Joel Richardson had this to say, quote, President Obama and his left-wing supporters in the media think it is absolutely hilarious that his policies could have fostered in an apocalyptic atmosphere in the earth, end quote. So, yes, Joel yeah, Richardson, right. we do find that absolutely hilarious. You're correct in assuming we're not laughing with you. It's 100%, right. 100p at you. It's very good that you understand what's happening. That's yes, nice. That's why we're talking about Refreshing. it on a comedy show. Now, don't get us wrong. We're we're still terrified that you're not also laughing at you. But, yeah, it's it's just hilarious. <laughs> and in 7.8 on the Prichter scale news tonight, Christian preacher and festering anal bacterium Tony Miano found the bright side of the Nepalese earthquake that killed 5,200 people and counting this week and offered it in the form of a tweet prayer. Quote, Praying for the lost souls in Nepal, praying not a single destroyed pagan temple will be rebuilt and the people will repent and receive Christ. End tweet. Okay, well... That's great for the Nepalese people, I guess, but, you know, the fuck are all the heathens in India and Bangladesh supposed to do? Just hope there's another deadly earthquake so they can find Jesus? I mean, that's a big risk. They could die between then and now. Dick. So, yes, let's set aside all the human suffering, the ruined families, the lost homes, the businesses that will never be rebuilt, the famines and disease that will come on the heels of this thing, the scarcity of humanitarian aid, the horrific injuries, and the permanently devastated communities so that we can focus on what really matters, <laughs> that the nation submits to the correct fabricated transdimensional superhuman spirit emancipator. Sure, thousands of people are dead, but at least God finally got a chance to knock down all those architecturally significant treasures of Nepalese culture that he hated so much. About time. I guess it all worked out in the end, though. Happy yeah, ending. No, it was and from the two Sunni file tonight, according to a story from the Moroccan news channel Al Yum Twenty Four, the founder of an Arabic online sex shop called El Asira has considered opening a retail store in the holy city of Mecca. Huh. Which is weird because, as I understood it, the old saying in the sex toy business is, you know, location, location, location. It's I, all I thought it was about. holy, holy, holy. <laughs> I, I guess that's the same similar, thing, basically. Similar idea, yeah. yeah. So, non nonetheless, <laughs> Mr. Abdelaziz Aura is the entrepreneur in question, and he hopes his line of Islam-friendly Intimate items may finally bring the elusive female orgasm to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Not bloody likely. Or or maybe this is just an elaborate sting operation to see which one of them still have clits. You know, any any chick that walks <laughs> so, in the door is like, yeah, that's pretty suspect. Right. So the story broke a couple weeks ago, and since then, several other news sources have labeled it as sensationalist, suggesting that a business would never be allowed by the authorities of that type, which... Sounds pretty accurate to me. Mm -hmm. However, Mr. Aura claims he already has the thumbs up from a Saudi cleric, and he promises the store and its products would be Sharia compliant. Oh, whatever well, the fuck that yeah, would be in right? that context. <laughs> um, not sure what the guy's planning exactly, but based on my knowledge of Saudi Arabia's extra misogynistic version of Sharia law. We're talking about a cucumber stand at best. I mean, so, this, I, I don't know what he was So, he's going to have to get pretty creative, I would imagine. 
or start listening to the show. We're going to need 30 seconds on the clock. Ideas for the Middle Eastern Muslim sex shop. Go. All right, all right. We're going to start with a nod to our friends Tom and Cecil over at Cognitive Dissonance and go with a long black cock. (laughs) What um, What about... the the whispering eye slit crotchless burka by whispering ayatollah only at the a la cock bar <laughs> of course and I guess uh, I, I should throw out another nod to our friend Adam Reeks over at the herd mentality and go with an eight camel power solid gold butt plug <laughs> right, yeah, that's about? extra racist if you don't listen to Adam's show it's, it's racist one way or the yeah, other but it's extra say, racist extra could it have been? <laughs> possibly been as well as the rest of this list everybody we apologize in advance <laughs> Um, all right, what about, uh, Cutter of Nine Tails, home of the pigskin pleather miracle whip? Right, yes, yeah, so you'll Something find in that Dil in the Doha. sub-honor <laughs> killing S&M section along with the Kaba gags. I don't apologize for that one, by the way. I'm sorry for all the other ones, but not that one, you assholes. All right, what about, what about the FG Emporium sex shop? Your wife will feel like wow. she still has a clit, guaranteed. <laughs> Damn, like a strap-on clit. I love it. Um, how about some al wide jelly? If, if we can fit an airplane into a building, his dick in your ass is no problem. I definitely apologize for that one. What about, what about finding the jihad spot? Holy coronal beads for those jihad-to-reach places. <laughs> or maybe madrasa to assa two headed dildos. Boko Haram him home. How about jamal cocky? Discreet second humps for dromedary oh, riders. Just gets more racist as Suction we go. Cup. How about halal you can eat brand edible panties? <laughs> Something to sink your hadith into. <laughs> what about get off with their heads? Add some spices to your marriage. <laughs> what do I always have to be the cage journalist? Oh, wow. <laughs> Ouch. How about Tripoli's Stippoli Nippoli? Home of the Libyan Sibian. <laughs> <laughs> Saved all my rhymes for the end. All right, what about uh, Arabian nightstand vibrators? Al Sheikh, straddle and roll. <laughs> there we go. And now I'm always going to wonder what's <laughs> under the burqa. Heath, thanks as always. <laughs> Jumanji. And when we come back, Lucinda will be here to emphatically agree that the New Testament is at least five books too long so far. <laughs> The Holy The book of Acts exists to fill the theological gap between the epistles and the gospels while simultaneously filling the literary gap between the gospels and the epistles. The title of the book, officially The Acts of the Apostles, is a bit misleading as we only really focus on one apostle, Peter, and then we just kind of lose track of him and pretty quickly go follow Paul around on a bunch of aimless wanderings. Yeah, they spent four entire books telling the same Jesus story, you know, and now I'm all excited that anything else is about to right. happen. All they did was the same bullshit stories again with, like, new names. I think they really peaked a little early on Jesus dying. Should have saved not, that for the end, yeah. Good move. And, of course, it just wouldn't be the babble without Lucinda's adorable giggle. Lucinda, Jesus is dead. Why the fuck are we still reading this thing? Hey, I asked myself the same question at least once a verse. All right, well, then let's get this one the fuck over with, huh? Well, the first post-Jesus thing they need is a new apostle to replace Judas, after the contradictory hanging, headlong, gut-spilling he did. So they settle for some dude named Matthias. Because, come on, what are you going to do? You're going to run around being the 11 apostles without... (laughs) You're going to look like a bunch of assholes. And it must have been this awkward moment for the other guy named Judas the right. whole time. He's like lobbying for nicknames. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you guys should – maybe you call me Adolf from now on. I don't know. <laughs> I just feel like it's going to be complicated for everyone to keep it straight. You're Judas, son of James. We'll say the whole thing every time. We promise. <laughs> just relax over there, Christ killer. <laughs> so all the apostles are hanging out in Jerusalem like Jesus told them. And a few days later, God reaches out like a flaming octopus and touches all of them <laughs> with tongues of fire. So they all start speaking different languages. Kind of odd. Right. All the languages in the world, except the ones God hadn't heard of yet. Yeah, right. Here's the passage. Quote, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. End quote. What are the odds? So, yeah, we've got 12 idiots having a circle jerk with a kraken and 
screaming nonsense at the top of your lungs. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, the very next hotel room has the entire UN General Assembly, so right. they all notice each world language specifically, and, yeah. and therefore Jesus. Right. It's yes. Real. It's a real so, thing that happened there. Of course, all the townspeople assume at first that they just got drunk on, like, spontaneous osmotic linguistic booze, <laughs> so they dismiss it until Peter sets them straight. It's like, hey, guys, it's yeah. 9.30 in the morning. They're not drunk. Come on. Come on. <laughs> and he invokes Joel here to tell everyone that this marks the beginning of the last days. Yeah. So the last three quarters of a million days plus <laughs> start right <laughs> there. <laughs> exactly yeah. that moment. No. And then Peter makes this big, Jesus definitely came back from the dead, and if you don't believe us, just ask a speech, and everybody in earshot immediately becomes a Christian. <laughs> then Peter and John heal a crippled dude, and when all the Jews say, hey, that was nifty, Peter responds by telling them to go fuck themselves for killing Jesus. He did a lot of that. <laughs> he did. And his whole speech sounds like he's wearing a wire, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> Remember that really good wine we had the day after all you Jews killed Christ? What grape was that? Well, you killed good Christ and what grape? Which grape? I heard someone say we killed Jesus Pinot Noir. Got it. I'm writing that down. Jews killed Jesus Pinot Noir. Got it. All right, so now they get arrested for healing without a proper license or whatever, and then the judges ask them to stop talking about Jesus, but they're unable to shut the fuck up, which sets a precedent that Christians would continue to follow for at least 2,000 years and running. <laughs> and they were also definitely communists. No Clearly. question. They go out of their way to remind everyone that the apostles acting under Jesus' command were absolutely positively communist. Yeah, Jesus and his crew would have chosen the National Socialist Party before they chose the Tea Party. Right. Mm -hmm. GOP Christians... uh. I'm sure you're all listening. Better or worse, you're supposed to be bleeding heart liberals. Rich people tricked you. Read the fucking book. It's right, it's right there. there. In fact, like, God is such a commie that in chapter 5, when Ananias has the audacity to give the apostles only most of everything he owned instead of all of everything he owned, God strikes him dead on the spot. And his wife, just for good measure. Right, yes, way. exactly. Then each of the apostles empowers seven... Uh, Sub apostles, I guess, right. and each of them gets miracle powers too. Hooray! They go out and yeah. miracles miracle. for everyone, and and one of them is a dude named Stephen who also gets arrested for being all Jesusy. Yeah, but during the trial, the judge notices how smoking hot Stephen is, so they give him an opportunity to summarize the entire Pentateuch <laughs> in his defense. <laughs> yes, he does. he does. But then he closes it by calling all of them a bunch of assholes, so they stone him to death anyway. Didn't, didn't work yeah. so well. No. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the conclusion of his speech wasn't the smartest move. Basically, if you guys read your book, every time you meet a holy prophet, you stone him to death. Wait, but don't do that to me. That was <laughs> right. I'm just, <laughs> a, just saying. It's a bad idea is what I mean. And apparently Saul, who we meet with no fanfare whatsoever, watches everybody's coat while they throw rocks at Stephen. I guess that's his job. He's the coat watcher. Very important that we know that. Yes, for and then moment. we get Saul Paul's road to Damascus moment, which basically goes like this. Saul's running around killing Christians when Jesus shows up and says, why you got to be killing my people, motherfucker? And he strikes him blind for three days. Then um, Ananias shows up, but not the one God killed for being stingy. There's they, like three yeah. Ananiases they, in this They just couldn't yes. be bothered to think of they another name. Some more names. Right. Yeah, and touches Saul so he can regain his sight. And, and now the Bible says that something like scales fell from his eyes, so the Jesus splooged in his face mm -hmm. theory does have some kind of <laughs> biblical justification there. <laughs> and if you're not convinced, just ask Cash from Atheists on Air. He can definitely vouch for the... You know, adhesive properties being suggested in this passage. Oh. Yes, he can. So he stops persecuting Christians and becomes a Jesus freak. Flip-flopper. Uh, so then the authorities <laughs> try to kill him. But as we've learned a couple of times in the New Testament, the authorities are awful at trying to kill people. Right. Yeah, so. And here's another part where they blatantly steal from the prequel. The writers are saying, the Jews seem to love it when baby Moses escaped in that basket, so we've got to use another basket escape. That's how it – what if we lower him in a basket through a hole in the city wall? And someone says, okay, but that's a, that's a ceiling. Right. You're describing. <laughs> right. The, the basket thing is great. That's great. But you can't lower anything through a horizontal hole. So <laughs> work that, that writer got fired, and they stuck with the lowering through a wall thing. 
for some reason, book. yeah. And then Peter cures a bunch of people. And uh, now I think that's kind of underreported because mm-hmm. according to the Bible, in numerous places, people who believe in Jesus can heal the blind, move mountains, make the lame walk, bring dead mm-hmm. chicks back to life. The Bible is very clear about this. Christians have superpowers. So unless <laughs> Christians have superpowers, unless Benny Hinn is legit, <laughs> Christianity is definitely bullshit. <laughs> Jury's out. And then they start letting Gentiles into the religion, and it all goes to shit from there. Right, no and good. now this one had me do a double take, okay? So according to Peter, there was no cross. <laughs> no. <Nope. Nope. laughs> Acts, Acts 39 and 40, or I'm sorry, chapter 10, verses 39 and 40. Peter's talking to Cornelius and his assembled non-Jews about Jesus. Quote, we are witnesses to all he did in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. <laughs> But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. I guess all the churches started installing lynching dioramas in front of the room. and It wasn't working out with right. a religious motif, so they switched to the nailed to a cross thing instead. And I guess that's a, a slight improvement, but still not great. <laughs> no, still not, not really. It's easier weird. to you know have in a, a building that just collapsed, I guess, than a tree. <laughs> so now all the Jesus Jews are pissed that Peter taught Gentiles the secret handshake, but he recounts the vision he got from God all... 11 paragraphs of it that we just read in the preceding fucking chapter, so all of a sudden they're cool with it. Then Herod starts fucking with Christians and arrests Paul again, but God sends an angel again that breaks him out again, and everyone is amazed uh, again. (laughs) So clearly they've already run out of ideas. Obviously. Okay, but let's be fair. It did work pretty well for the plot of International Gorillas. That <laughs> movie much. was great and made perfect sense. Sure. Uh, compared to the Bible, sure. <laughs> so Saul, who suddenly became Paul without any explanation at all, uh, goes to teach Sergius Paulus about the Messiah, and a magician tries to stop him. So Paul uses his magic Jesus powers to strike him temporarily blind. Mm. And yes, by funny. the way, the magician's name is... Bar Jesus. Yeah, right. <laughs> Bar Jesus? It might as well have been Bizarro Jesus, the evil Jew wizard. Jews are bad. Right. Jews, bad. <laughs> wizard. And another, again with a temporarily blind, like, come up with some new shit. No. Just make his dick stock porking or something. Then just as you're thinking, I sure hope somebody summarizes Deuteronomy through Second Chronicles. Paul does exactly that. That's a lot of that. <laughs> then they all sit down and have a long overdue, why are we chopping up our dicks conversation. <laughs> right? It's about time. Uh, which they decide that even the foreskinned are allowed to not burn in hell. I'm sure they <laughs> Probably do. Probably makes the faith a little more marketable, <laughs> yeah, I would think. It's right? a good, good call. So the focus groups are going pretty well. Everybody seems <laughs> to enjoy the plot and the characters. It's just one thing. It's just one little note. The part with the penis chopping, is everybody tied to that? <laughs> Not at all, even slightly. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> right. We're all on the same page. We're going with entire Christian penises well, from now wasn't on. wasn't a lot of fighting in the room, entire was Christian there? But as a matter of fact, they also dumbed Deal. down the 613 commandments for the Gentiles and decide that they, they, they narrow it way down, actually. They decide that you're allowed to go to heaven as long as you don't sacrifice to idols, mm-hmm. drink blood, strangle your food, or fornicate. Mm-hmm. Acts 14, 20, and 29. Nothing about bacon cakes for the gays there, folks. <laughs> no, That's all. Left that one out. Weird. The four command lips. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And then in chapter 16, verse 10, suddenly we're in first person. For right. no Nowhere. fucking reason at all, with no fucking warning, <laughs> at the beginning of the paragraph, it's they, and by the end, it's we. Mm-hmm. So fucking confusing. Oh, lying. That's called lying. <laughs> and, and the I, they, someone, someone... Killed my wife, Nicole, and that Jewish waiter. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul and I go to Macedonia, where some demonic fortune-telling slave girl starts following them around, yelling, these guys are totally legit, for like three days, which apparently annoys the shit out of Paul. It wouldn't annoy me. So he yanks the fortune-telling demon out of her, and this, of course, pisses off her owners, because they were making mad bank off of her fortune-telling demon, so they grabbed us, stripped us naked, beat us with rods, and then threw us in prison. And apparently God didn't have any angels handy because this time he broke them out of prison with an earthquake. And we switched back to third person again. Yeah, right. <laughs> so in response, everybody praises Jesus and burns their books. Naturally. Yes, That's very, very pro-book burning message in chapter 19. <laughs> then Paul goes to Jerusalem, even though everybody tells him not to. And as soon as he gets there, they seize him and start whipping the shit out of him. Right, right. But luckily, they're they're one of those murderous mobs that shuts up when you ask for a minute to defend yourself. So of course they do. <laughs> he does. So Paul does. Right. And his defense is basically, I'm a Jew, so 
you know, how bad could I possibly be? Right. And as boring as that chapter was, I did find an interesting nugget there. Apparently, the first century Jerusalem equivalent of booing was stripping naked and throwing <laughs> dirt in the air. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> I'm thinking that would be a really easy response to misinterpret. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think they like Push. me. Yeah. It really shows how things evolve over time. Right? You get lost in translation. Because <laughs> nowadays, if you strip naked and throw dirt in the air, that means I'm a crazy person and I want you to fuck me on this loose pile of dirt. <laughs> right. That's, that's, exactly. what I, that's how that that's works what now. That's what I would think, sure. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the crowd is unimpressed and the centurions decide to flog him. But apparently being a Roman citizen is a get-out-of-flogging-free card, so they let him go this time. Well, kind of, but a bunch of Jewish priests are so pissed about this that they concoct the stupidest assassination idea in history, okay? So they <laughs> vow not to eat or drink anything until they've killed Paul. Seems like if you don't get him in the first 10 hours or so, this this concept falls prey to diminishing returns damn quick, doesn't it? I don't think it worked for yeah. him. Luckily, though, or unluckily, if you were hoping this book would just fucking end, uh, Paul hears about the plot, and they mobilize the cavalry to get him safely to the governor so he can stand trial. Right, but since the governor can't figure out what the fuck the Jews are even accusing him of, they keep him in prison for a couple of years while they try to sort it out. Yeah, so Felix is the guy in charge. He's the governor of... Judea Not and, the cat. And Felix's <laughs> plan was to throw this destitute, communist, desert nomad in jail till he can solicit a bribe uh, of sandal dirt? Well, I have no right. idea what he was thinking. The plan didn't work. He no, didn't, surprise, didn't get surprise. any sandal dirt or <laughs> bribes of any sort. And then he gets to Rome and he lives under house arrest for a couple of years. And then the book just abruptly ends. Yep, that was that's it. it. That's the it. End. Just for <laughs> slap. <laughs> yeah. Basically, we're left with Paul explaining to the emperor of Rome, you know, listen, you clearly got the Jews under control. They love that book, working great. So just let me pull the same shit with the non-Jews, and that's <laughs> everybody. You control all the people at that point. Have I showed you the novel? We've been working on it. <laughs> we've got some, good, we've got some epistles going here. And that's it. We, we just we forego any real discussion of Christian theology again, five books in. We haven't gotten any of that so that we could emphasize that both Peter and Paul got their balls knocked around quite a bit for this Jesus guy. But I also can't help but come back over and over again to the fact that in the book— People accept Jesus because they see Peter and Paul perform miraculous healings, you know, wrestle demons, survive poisonous snake bites, that kind of shit. So when did it become a sin to ask for evidence? As soon as somebody asked for evidence, if I had to guess. Right, yes. Evidence book. Yeah. It's all set. Right. Well, for whatever it's worth, all the books between here and the last one are like tweets compared to the shit we've been through so far. So, <laughs> Lucinda Heath, thanks again, as always. Good to be here. Gentile Manji. <laughs> and Babble. <laughs> Good timing on that. It's time for the part of the show that comes next, listener feedback. This is the part of the show that comes before the next part. Our first message comes from Melissa, who wrote to us to take issue with my use of the word tranny in last week's episode, which I definitely did not mean to offend. Regardless, Melissa writes, quote, I was just listening to today's podcast, and I was enjoying it until you started saying tranny. I don't know if you're aware of this, but that's a pretty nasty slur along the lines of faggot or nigger. Please be aware that this is not an okay word to use, and try not to use it again. End quote. Mm -hmm. So, I'll start by saying that all the words are okay to use. I'm sorry, but they are. True. Melissa's email contained the F word and the N word, for example. Point being, context is the issue here, obviously. So, let's not forget the context of the segment in question. We were listing things the bigots would call their bigoted bathroom brigade, just to be clear. And right. let's also remember the context of the entire headline, the entire episode, and our entire show with respect to transgender equality. Also, a quick technical point, the flushing trannies thing, it, it, it's an existing phrase that relates to car transmission repair. So flushing the transgendered wouldn't have tied together my, you know, hilarious play on words quite so well, so I kind of had to use it. <laughs> right. One last thing, 
where was Melissa's outraged email when we used the F word, the N word, and every other offensive word that exists in similar sarcastic segments in the past? Right. I mean, if you haven't noticed, we use a lot of the not okay to use words on this show. And and not that I don't appreciate the fact that you're out there educating people on the use of this term. I do think that's important. But I also think it's a bit hyperbolic to say it's a slur along the lines of faggot or nigger since there's just no fucking way somebody's using those terms without realizing that they're slurs. Yeah. I'm not trying to say that like dehumanizing one group is better or worse than dehumanizing another group, but we heard our own case when we overstate it. So I think that's important. So certainly there was no intention on our part to offend anyone, but the bigots on that one, in case that wasn't clear. Right. Now, all that being said, like we are glad you sent the email because it's entirely possible that some of our listeners don't know it as an offensive term, and we don't want to reinforce their ignorance. So thanks for reaching out one way or the other. That's why we felt like we needed to include it. Good information either way. Absolutely. Yeah. And finally, we got an email from Janine, who was livid when she and her kids inadvertently stumbled on some answers in Genesis bullshit. She writes, quote, In order to counterbalance the mind fuck my daughter receives at school regarding God, etc., I promote science whenever possible. She follows Awesome Science on Instagram like a lot of kids. They recently posted a cool pic of a pink lake in Western Australia. I was super curious about what made the lake pink and asked her to Google it. When she Googled it, I shit you not, the website directs you to Answers in Genesis, where two little boys explain how all the Earth's places like the Grand Canyon are proof the Bible is correct about history. Ridiculous. I am so fucking pissed off. Those little shits need to be exposed. Science my ass. Actually, my ass produces better scientific theories than these kids do. They sell videos. All right. So, yes, it appears that uh, this is a fucking creationist propaganda site masquerading as science sites for kids. So, apparently... Parents have to keep up with which science accounts their kids are following and Googling. So God, thanks for me. the heads up, Janine. Yeah, all right. So we figure it's only a matter of time before they branch out into the video game business as well. And that brings us to this week's top ten. It's going to be answers in Sega Genesis creationist video game ideas. All right. So these are some that you could avoid. Maybe the epic art quest called Tidal Fantasy. That would be number ten. <laughs> At number nine, Young Earthworm Jim. That would be fun. Uh, number eight, Moronic the Hedgehog and his sidekick, Fairy Tales. <laughs> number seven, The Legend of Zelohim, a missing link to the past. Uh, number six, Inbred Dead Redemption, perhaps. <laughs> number five, F Zero. It starts at one AD. <laughs> Makes more sense that way. Just go straight from negative one to one. Might obviously. as well. Number four, Washboard Hero. <laughs> Number three, three Kentucky. <laughs> number three, Coke Brothers Super Pac Man. <laughs> Obviously, and number two, how about point zero 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 four three five percent of Sid Meier's Civilization? <laughs> and the number one bullshit creationist video game idea: rebuke Nukem. Kind of like American foreign policy. <laughs> hey, now wait, we haven't nuked anybody in decades, man. Come on. <laughs> and that's all the feedback you get. If you want more, keep sending us those emails, tweets, and Facebook messages. You'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Before we take our bows tonight, I wanted to take one more opportunity to thank the Hickory Humanists for inviting us up for ReasonCon again this year. Also need to thank everybody who made it out to see us. And while there are way too many awesome people that I met this weekend to name them all, I do want to say if you're a fan of cognitive dissonance, I can confirm Tom and Cecil are two of the most genuine, generous, hilarious, and fun-loving human beings I've ever had the pleasure of hanging out with. And David from my Book of Mormon, he's just okay. Now, they were taking video of our roast, and I have assurances that eventually that will be available as soon as it is. We're going to post it on our Facebook page, our Twitter account, the blog, all that shit. And if you're not already excited about that, I can now tell you that Eli provided the audio for God's re-roast. And damn it, if he didn't stun the room silent a couple of times, it was fucking priceless. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Rat, returning after a one-week hiatus on Monday at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Obviously, I need to thank Heath for a hell of a lot more than I have time to thank him for here. I need to thank the lovely Lucinda Lusions for her increasingly amazing contributions to the show. I wanted to thank the prophet Jeremiah from No Religion Required Podcast for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. They're putting together a hell of a podcast over there. Every time I listen to it, it's better than the last time. If you haven't checked him out, 
or you checked him out very early, I would strongly recommend you give him another try. You'll find a link on the show notes for this episode at scathingatheist.com. But most of all, of course, I need to thank this week's best people, Jack, Elliot, Luke, Rob, Jerry, Nicholas, Bobby, Nico, Kelly, Sean, Tyler, Peter, Mark, Will, and David. Jack, Elliot, Luke, Rob, and Jerry, whose ejaculations have aftershocks, Nicholas, Bobby, Nico, Kelly, and Sean, who are so laid back they can turn a diamond back into coal, and Tyler, Peter, Mark, Will, and David, who can't take dick pics without a fisheye lens. Together, these 15 ferociously formidable, frighteningly fuckable, and fashionably factual folks have helped hold the army of theocrats at bay for one more week by giving us money. Not everybody has the wit, style, or impressive physique required to give us money, but if you think you're up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, which you'll find linked on our homepage, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but you can't get over the logical hurdle of paying for something that you're already getting for free, you can also help us a ton by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or anywhere else you can think of. Somebody might look for a five-star review for us or by telling a soulless, hell-bound friend about the show. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. All the music used in this episode was written and performed by yours truly, and yes, I did have my permission. thermometer <laughs> where's my pen love it love it because <laughs> he's got the award in his ass the guy's walking around with an award in his ass or you an know. ass pen or an ass pen